Okay, uh, welcome everyone to another of our uh, ICTS IAC joint uh, uh, Infosys uh, String Theory seminars uh, series, uh, uh, lecture series, I should say. And uh, we are very happy to have uh, Lakshya. Uh, Lakshya has done his PhD at uh, Perimeter Institute. Then he was at Harvard, and now he is uh, at Oxford. Uh, and uh, he will hopefully uh, not uh, frighten us too much with uh, uh, non-invertible symmetries, but will gently guide us through uh, this uh, somewhat intimidating sure. topic. Uh, but, uh, and I think uh, you may be aware that at ICTS we uh, uh, stop people all the time, and uh, so I hope you won't mind uh, uh, that uh, we might slow you down a bit, uh, but uh, uh, but we definitely like to learn more about the topic. So over to you, Lakshya. So uh, let me begin by thanking uh, th for inviting me. And uh, so recently in, in studies of formal quantum field theory and string theory, uh, generalized global symmetries have uh, emerged to be a uh, hot topic of research uh, and they have uh, they have been quite instrumental in understanding very fine aspects of quantum field theory uh, in making precise many of the uh, m many of the fine aspects like confinement and even giving us tools to compute confinement in uh, etc they have also been useful to and have a sharp understanding of uh, dualities in for example chan simons matter theories uh, and uh, more recently uh, there have been progress on something called non-invertible symmetries, uh, which are expected to be a very general structure of the most general structure of symmetries in quantum field theory, at least for finite symmetries. Uh, and these symmetries are expected to have a lot of uh, interesting consequences for the study of quantum field theory. So with this motivation in mind, uh, in these lectures, I want to uh, I want to describe uh, a generalized global symmetries uh, and going uh, with mostly focusing on non-invertible symmetries. And these symmetries uh, are framed in terms of uh, category theory and higher category theory. So the relationship and interplay between them would be a topic of interest to both physicists and mathematicians. And I hope to uh, take both these communities together in these lectures. So let me begin by outlining what the plan would be for the three lectures. So in the first one, I want to describe, just have a gentle introduction to generalized global symmetries. So here we will discuss symmetries known as higher form symmetries. which can be thought of as the simplest kinds of global symmetries uh, that are not the usual ones, that are slightly generalized. And if I have time, I will also discuss their close cousins, which are known as higher group symmetries. So these two kinds of symmetries are, are invertible in a sense that I will make precise. So these would be what are known as invertible. And very recently in the last one, one and a half years, people have uh, begin, have uh, dropped this restriction of invertibility and have started looking at non-invertible symmetries, which are the, which is the most exciting uh, subtopic of research in this field. And the next two lectures will be about these non-invertible symmetries. And here uh, we will look at uh, the, the, the case of first of two-dimensional quantum field theories, uh, symmetries in two-dimensional quantum field theories, uh, in which, in, in this context, symmetries have been explored for a long time, uh, but the, the language of generalized global symmetries was not available, but they still have been uh, studied, and this is what is related to category theory. And finally, uh, we will discuss uh, the things which are, which uh, have, 
due to which there has been lot of recent interest which is that no, the discovery of non invertible symmetries in higher dimensional quantum field theories and these are related to higher category theory Uh, and throughout these lectures, uh, I will like to uh, the so the the example that I would be focusing on would be on gauge theories. So some gen generic gauge theories, which need or need not have may or may not have a supersymmetry. They can be non-supersymmetric, uh, and we will see that even the simplest of gauge theories have these generalized global symmetries. They have higher form, higher group symmetries, and they have higher categorical symmetries as well. Okay. So let me begin uh, by discussing the modern point of view on symmetries. Okay, so And I should emphasize that I will only discuss global symmetries and not gauge symmetries. So there is also global symmetries. And let me begin by what the most general definition of symmetries that has emerged in the last few years. Uh, and to motivate this definition, let me begin with the example of quantum mechanics that we will all be familiar with. So. In quantum mechanics, uh, which uh, let me represent it as zero plus one dimensional quantum field theory. So we are now in quantum mechanics. And what we typically do is we can compute some transition amplitudes. So we have some state at some initial time and final time. This is a time axis. So at some initial and final times, we choose some states. And then we insert some local operators at various times. And we compute uh, transition amplitudes, which take this form. And in this context, uh, a symmetry is uh, usually defined as first of all a unitary operator. And second, that it should commute with, so let me call it U. And second, that it should commute with the Hamiltonian. And so a consequence of these two properties, and most importantly, the second one, is that it's, uh, if, you, if you compute its correlation functions, uh, then these functions are independent of the point of time where you insert this operator u. Yes. Right. Uh, no, not right now. So there would be some kind of time reversal symmetries, and I'm looking at non-time reversal symmetries for the moment. But I should emphasize it's not really this property one that will be important, but it's really the property two that would be important. So you can have an anti-unitary operator; it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, the same same structure will follow. And in fact, I will drop this property one. So, okay. So, a consequence of this property is the, as follows: that if I insert now, so I had some operators over here, and suppose I insert my operator u at any time in between, say, t one and t two, uh, then this transition amplitude remains the same even if I change the time, uh, 
the, the time location where I insert this operator. So say if I insert it now at a T prime between these operators, uh, then the correlation function remains the same. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That that what? Yes. Okay. So uh, right. So we have this equality following from the second uh, second property, and this means that the location of this operator u is topological along this line. Because I can move it around, and unless un, unless I hit some other operator, my correlation function does not change. So this means uh, that u uh, insertions of u are topological uh, away from other insertions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you you was defined in terms of some some other operators which were time dependent, and then this combination turned out to be uh, independent of time. Okay. So in general, you would also have the time evolution operator relating the psi psi and the psi get and the psi bra, right? So I can get that. You you also have the time evolution operator translating the initial state to the final state, right? Time evolution operator has to be there, right? Yeah, there, there is a there, there is a time evolution from the initial to the final time. Yeah, so it generally is determined in terms of the exponential of the Hamiltonian, right? E to the i h t. Uh, yes. So this is going on in the Heisenberg picture. Okay. So even in the Heisenberg picture, you have that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Right, so, so the main lesson that from this quantum mechanical example that we wanted to learn is, is this is on this sentence. And now as we move on to the example of quantum field theory and general symmetries, this will be the definition of symmetry that we will encounter. And notice that here I could have, they, they've, I had taken this to be a unitary operator, but I can drop this assumption. So I can take some kind of projector or something uh, mean this this was enforcing what is known as invertibility. So this was making the symmetry invertible, but I could just consider some other operators which are non-invertible, uh, but they still commute with the Hamiltonian. So this is how non-invertible symmetries would arise in quantum mechanics. Uh, now let's move on to a general dimensional quantum field theory. Right, but this is a generalization that, uh, so in, in quantum field theory, we encounter non-invertible symmetries. Right. It, it contains more information than just a set of invertible unitary operators which commit with the Hamiltonian. So for instance, let's take a project on the back. Mm -hmm. That variation should commit to the Hamiltonian. Right. Yeah. This one has this. Why, why would I call this a symmetry as well? In what sense is this project as? Well. Um, the first point is that the word symmetry was traditionally thought of as something invertible. So maybe the use of the word symmetry, I know it's become 
So in higher dimensional quantum field theories, uh, the fact that these operators are topological will imply that they are RG flow invariant. So they are useful for studying RG flow invariant properties of quantum field theory. And that's what we want the sim to use symmetries for. Here in quantum mechanics, these, uh, it's, I agree, it's not so important. All I wanted to point out is that we will encounter non-invertible and invertible distinction. And this quantum mechanical language is just simply dropping the first, this first condition. Mm -hmm. For the non-invertible ones? Yeah, no, I don't think so because it will be a projection. So you will lose some information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it can be, may not be normalized, but it can be a state like the project onto the vacuum will project onto the vacuum. Uh, so uh, it will have some normalization. But. Uh, I, I think normally we uh, look at the unitary, this thing, uh, to also look at uh, degeneracy, I guess. So then, uh, uh, I mean, you, you create another state which is linearly, in the, uh, uh, linearly independent but has the same energy and, and so on. Uh, but that probably here, you probably won't, uh, won't necessarily have... Um, uh, from yeah yeah uh, so once you see why it's useful that it will become clear yeah yes at the moment it is just a name uh, yes uh, uh, this one maybe it's semantic the unity and invertible are actually different things yes unity unitarity requires an arm and invertible is just yes so uh, are you considering non-unity operators or non-unity uh, non uh, well, well, they're both. You can consider both kind of generalizations. Yeah. So the, the, this is this quantum mechanical example is mostly for motivation, uh, because this this starts giving motivation for why symmetries are something topological in a theory, uh, and then this uh, this just invertible versus no non-invertible notion is just tied to point one, uh, and this is yeah. When we move on to quantum field theory, this will become uh, clearer, I think. So let's move on to quantum field theory. Uh, okay, so now we generalize, we, we have more spatial dimensions. So what are the things that we can do? So again, I can consider operators inserted at a time slice. So say some operator And then the, the, the correlation functions might, you will have correlation functions for various operators inserted at different locations in space time. And then these correlation functions might be, uh, might be invariant when, we, when you move u of t around as you, as you change time slice t. So this is at least the property that we demand from charge operators. But there's actually more that you can do because you have more spatial dimensions. Uh, you can ask whether correlate, whether this is also equal to inserting it along some other locus. So now you need to define this operator uh, in a space-time fashion. So you have defined this operator u along this uh, along some general slice in space time. Okay. It turns out for the usual kinds of symmetries that we are used to, this property also holds true. So this equality holds true. And why is that? Mm 
Yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, for a usual kind of global symmetry, say I have, we have a U1 global symmetry. Uh, so, this comes with a Noether current. So, the standard way of defining it is that you have a Noether current, which is a vector in space time. And then uh, you define this operator u as something, so it comes in a family parameterized by theta. And then you define it by uh, inserting, uh, okay. something like this, uh, where n mu is the normal uh, to the to, to this to this to the slice that you have. Uh, okay, L let me say in another fashion. So you can first dualize this to a d minus one form by using uh, the Levi Chivita tensor. So now you have this form, let me call it J. It's a D minus one form. And you can now integrate it along a co dimension one manifold in space time. So you can have e to the i theta integral of J on some co dimension one manifold. So this would be the definition of the operator u that we are looking for. And indeed, if you make small adjustments in, in this manifold, so say you're looking at u theta, and then you add to it as something which is the boundary of a d-dimensional, a, a small d-dimensional uh, some manifold of space time where d is the space-time dimension, then you can see from this expression that, so you obtain so you can write this thing as this on m d minus 1 times the integral of dj on the manifold md. So it's just the calculus of differential forms. So I'm adding to my manifold another piece. So here I have uh, some, some manifold. Yes, and they're related by No, I'm just deforming it a little bit. Yes. So I'm deforming it by something which is exact. Yeah. Right. Right. And now uh, this term is just one because dj is zero which is just a differential form statement for the usual fact that this current is conserved, uh, that d mu j mu is zero. Uh, well, so I just deform it by a little bit and then it's, uh, the difference between the two is just a boundary of something d dimensional. Is it clear? Maybe I can use another color. So this is MD and then we deform it to something like this. And then the difference between these two is just uh, on the, it's just uh, this much, which is just the boundary of the thing inside. Yes. 
Ya. Okay. So now we have seen that in our usual notions of symmetries obey this property that if you insert them at any co dimension one locus in space time and you slightly deform the topological, the, the operator, where the, the location of the where you place this operator, as long as you do not hit other operator insertions, your correlation functions are invariant. Yes. So now, uh, how about discrete global symmetry? So that's the first generalization that we want to consider. Okay, so how about discrete? And then uh, I claim that Hello? it can be, it's actually, it, yeah. yeah. So this is still invertible, right? Yeah, this is all invertible for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, actually it, thinking in terms of this topological operator, gives a uniform definition for which is valid for both discrete and continuous symmetries. So you can think of continuous symmetries as having some operators u theta, which are topological, but theta is not, a, not taking a value which is continuous along a circle, but taking it along some points in that circle. Uh, okay, so why do we say that? Well, one thing that you can do is you can, suppose you have a, in your theory, a field phi, which has charge n. So we again go back to our theory, which had a u1 global symmetry. And we say that we have a field phi, which has charge n under this u1 global symmetry. And let's give it a web. So when we give it a web, we know that our global, our global symmetry group u1 will break down to zn. So now we have gone to a theory which has a discrete global symmetry. Uh, and so what happens to these topological operators when you have given this web? Uh, okay, so. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, th those are not included in this motivation, but I claim that those are also associated to topological operators. That's, that's a way to think about these symmetries. So anytime you have any discrete global symmetry in any quantum field theory, you should think that there is a co-dimension one topological operator corresponding to it. Yes, yes. So there is no, it cannot be written in terms of a local current as an integral of a local current, but the charge operator always exists, the exponential charge operator. Right, so here I was giving the motivation that you can think at least in this kind of situations where you can obtain something by giving a web, you can obtain a discrete symmetry by activating a web. Uh, you can uh, look at what happens to these topological operators. So you had these operators u theta. And now when you're going to deform them, you're going to actually pick up a piece which is proportional to the integral of web in this reason, in the deform, deformation reason. So they will cease to be topological, uh, right? And only those will be, and this will also be proportional to, uh, so theta, n times theta. So for theta, which are multiples of two pi over n, uh, this, the, the, the non-topological term will vanish and those topological operators will survive. So u theta for theta equal to two pi j over n, where with j equal to one, to n minus one, will still remain topological after giving the web. Uh, you want to charge? Right, so let's just take a 
Yes. So you have a condensate for this field and when you're going to deform it uh, because okay so uh, yeah I should have first uh, given a pre-step before going over there. So for this operator phi and for the u theta uh, the, there was a com non, there was a commutativity relationship between them which state, stated that if you move this u theta beyond this operator phi yes uh, but uh, it's a space time picture we have uh, dropped our time direction yes yeah, now time can still run vertically it's a, it's a space time picture from now on we won't have a time direction anymore uh, yeah, you can, you can take time to be running along this. I, I'm doing Euclidean theories, so yeah. So I, throughout this talk, I'll be in Euclidean theories. I should have mentioned. Is it very important? No, it, no, it wasn't important at all. Yeah, it's just uh, I, I can draw it the other way. It's fine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So now the charge of this field will come over here. So it will be something like it to the two pi i. Uh, okay, so theta, sorry, e to the i theta n. So that's, yeah. Then you would consider only space like I think for at least for topological operators, I think you can. For non topological, uh, yeah, maybe still fine as well. Yeah, it won't matter, I think. But uh, there, there might be a distinction between uh, the kind of operators that you can put along space like, time like, and light like surfaces because they are inequivalent surfaces. Sorry, but your, your theta is 2pj divided by n. So this exponent is one. What is theta? Yeah, for this theta, this is one, which means that this field is does not transform under Z n subgroup of U one. Mm. Thank you. Right. So this is just capturing the fact that this field phi has charge n. Right. Uh, and now, once you have a condensate of this field, when you turn on a wave. So this field is present to everywhere and when you move this a little bit, you will obtain factors proportional to this e to the i theta n. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Minus charge one. Charge two. Charge two. Charge one. Charge one. Yes. Uh, charge one. 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 Charge Charge one. Which you insert, then you cannot pass this surface to Yeah, if you have charge one, then this will be e to the theta uh, over here. Suppose phi has charged. Yeah. Then what you have said is that you take this e2, mm -hmm. you can just move this out, right? Yes. Is one. Yes. But then the other fields of charge one, you can just insert. No? Yes. And this doesn't pass through those. Yeah, it doesn't pass through, but uh, uh, if you make it pass through, it gives you a phase factor. Right. Uh, yes. Yes. The integral dj is a delta function at that. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. Why are you writing the you just slice because it's acting on the entire? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's on a co-dimension one surface space time. And this is just a cartoon for any co-dimension one surface. Yeah, if I drop this. So, so is the Z2 example okay now? Right, so this is because your equations of motion get modified in the presence of a, an operator like phi if it's there. And you will find that dj uh, is actually a delta function supported at the location of that operator times n, which is the charge. Right, and so then when you move this around, this piece is not one anymore. It picks up a, it becomes a to the ion theta. Okay. So over here. Yeah. Is the same as well. This was a continuous calculation. If you have a field of charge n, then it modif, and you have inserted the field, it modifies the, the equation of motion. So this is the modification I wrote down. This. This is true for any. This is true for any insertion. But the key is then going to generalize to the case where there's a bed. So you can view the bed as as if there is an insertion. Yes. I mean, I don't know by whether this result is no. By itself, this is a true result. Yes. This is just a statement about the operator carrying uh, charge. It's just how the symmetry acts on charging. Right. right. So, and I was saying that if you have a condensate of this field, it's present everywhere. And so, when you're going to move around these u theta operators, only those operators will be topological under which this field was not charged. Right. Uh, okay. No, yes, the web. The, yeah, over here. Yeah, you will get the expectation value of five. That that would be the non-topological. The the thing that makes it non-topological. Uh, there is this condensate which is uh, the web of five. Even the web of phi is zero, yeah. Then the equation of motion in the presence of a condensate uh, mm -hmm. is uh, not dj is equal to expectation value of phi. It's not that. It's not uh, the equation of motion. Yeah. No, no, I agree. This, this, the, uh, this statement is made when you have flown down to the infrared. So you have a symmetry which is u1, you still have that u1 symmetry, you have a field which has charge n, now you give a web to this field, then at extremely low energies you are going to, because you have a condensate, these operators are going to behave as non-topological operators. But of course the ultraviolet operator is still topological. No, I'm not. Yeah, it was just part of a motivation. Yes. Yes. In the far infrared. Yeah. 
takes some if you are not using it properly, yeah, it's a skeleton confusing otherwise. Yeah. If you are not using it, I think it's fine. Yeah. But some of the non-trivial part seems to be that what you are saying is even when there is no local chain, mm -hmm. if it's a for normal display spectrum, you can still define this topological operators in terms of surfaces. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even though you are not integrating anything on that surface. Yes. So it's a it's a defect operator which exists on a on an integrated slice, but there is no local version of that operator. Yeah, he was motivating that, but I think more generally he wanted to associate uh, operator u theta with any discrete symmetry. Now, now you say even in the case where it's not, there's just a discrete symmetry. Yeah. Then you want to uh, associate an operator with the operator u of theta. Yeah. Because that's what you want. Yeah. Uh, no, no current. current. No current. Parameter. No current. Yeah. No current. So, so but. Let's just take uh, e u phi square minus m square phi square. Yeah. There's no local current. There's no He's local not current. saying there's a local current. He's just saying there's an operator which you associate with a dimension. He's not even saying that there. I, I think it's just that there is an there is an operator acting on the Hilbert space, which is not given by e to the i times some integral of a current, but it it is so it is labeled by a. Uh, by a space-time slice, yeah. and the, or rather the topologically inequivalent space-time slices. What is that operator in this case? It will be whatever the original operator was in yeah, the. So it will be five minus five. Yeah, there will be an operator, right? You can. Uh, so for each space-time slice, you will have an operator, and there'll be some algebra of those operators with the fields and which will depend on the topology like this thing right here he had right u theta times phi is e to the i theta into phi times u u theta that as you cross the initial surface in our point this operator with the there's an algebra right? this is a the commutator there's no it's not a commutator right? it's u theta it's not commutative yeah huh? it's not commutative it's not a commutator just, uh, I think fixed time slice is here. That's what. Fixed time slice is not. But what he's saying is that if you do not have a fixed time slice, you move it along. So, what does it mean in the world? So, it's just taking a fixed time slice and then an operator like this. Yeah. Then across an operator, there's a fixed time slice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so there will be a generalization of that. I mean, so he said that that defines the. So, so if you wish the u theta, that defines the u. That, that's the u theta on the other side. That's, that's the straight line. So, so it, it's yeah. like u left times phi is e to the i theta, phi times u right. Then, if you suppose you take this horizontal line yeah. and keep the boundary the same. But just deform it in the interior so it goes above that, right? It will be defined. Yeah. It will be a different object. Like this. And those two operators will be related by the space. So maybe it's a little misleading to call them both u theta because we think of them as the same thing. But it's really like a u left and a u right. I mean, they are associated with different topological. Yes. So that should have been u theta left and this is u theta right. Yes, so yeah. So with some code dimension when manifold. That is minus one plus Yeah. In this case there are the two operators are the same. So we can so now it's just stable by a number theta and slice over which it is defined. I mean the slice you're, you're just labeling it by a slice. Don't see how it has to be over a slice or a slice. You're just labeling it by a slice. It's not the topology of what the operator will be in. 
So you have an codimension one operator u, which can be inserted along any codimension one manifold, right? And then the claim is that if you insert it along two codimension one manifolds, such that in going between them there is no operator insertion, then the correlation functions are same. And if you and if yes. And when you go past a local operator, it gives you a factor of the charge. So this this is just a correlator in space time. And the two correlation functions, this one and this one, are related by a phase. They are not equal, but they are related by this phase, which depends on the on the charge of phi. Mm -hmm. that suppose we that uh, they are both is above like time is going upward. Yeah. We could in principle deform this slice so it goes below or above. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And that is a, is something that you couldn't write in terms of a normal time order. Right? Yeah. The point is that you write what the uh operators which are speech like each other time order totally it doesn't matter what order Okay. Uh, so now we will go to another generalization. So right now we have generalized from a continuous global symmetry to a discrete global symmetry. And we saw that the notion of having a topological, defining it in terms of a topological operator of co-dimension one uh, captured these two cases uniformly. Okay, so, but now there is a parameter still to play with. So we said that this, this topological operator was co-dimension one. But we can ask if there can be topological operators which have higher co-dimension. And this, so we are asking. Of co-dimension, instead of one, I can give an extra parameter. Let me call it p plus one, where p is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, no, in this case, uh, you said theta. Uh, uh, the, these for a let's say some discrete zn symmetry. Mm -hmm. You're saying the theta will only take these values. The values by j in over n. Yeah. So right? theta uh, takes values in the group that you have. But uh, for those values of theta, this phase vanishes. I mean, this phase is one. Yes. So no, I, I, I'm saying, are, are you? Can you, in a theory with Zn, uh, is it that the theta values are forced to take this for some reason, or theta can take any value? I just want to have a statement See, about that. So the, this was the equation valid in a theory which had u1 global symmetry and an operator of charge n. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So theta could take any value in theta u1. Theta could take any value. Fine. Now, once you give a web to this and you flow to the infrared, you will have a theory. Uh, which has a Zn global symmetry. And uh, in the infrared, only the Zn subgroup of this operators will uh, will, serve, will be topological. Okay, uh, fine. That's one case maybe. But supposing I started with a case in which there was just a Zn discrete symmetry yeah. not related to a global symmetry at all. Yeah. In that case also, are you, uh, there will be an algebra yes. like this, but for general right. theta or... 
So let, let me describe it in a bit detail for a ZN global symmetry. Uh, so Oh, only if you move through a charge of any, then you will get this. Yeah. So for instance, okay, fine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, there will be a charge M, which is not necessary. It will be in general a charge M. Yeah. So yes. the charge has content, so that that should be better than one. Why? So that so you will get in general for an arbitrary charge, you will get e to the i M times two pi yeah. a over M. Yeah. So let, let me describe the general general structure. It might be helpful because uh, uh, so if we have a global symmetry group, a usual global symmetry group G, which can be finite, continuous, or a mixture of anything, uh, then we have topological operators labeled by elements G and G, which are co-dimension one. So these are U G M D minus one, and then the, the product on G is captured in terms of an operator product expansion on these co-dimension one operators. So what this means is that suppose I take another one, UG prime, and I move this, this is topological, I move it and put it on top of this operator. Then I obtain the, the combined operator, the stacked operator, behaves as if it was the operator for the element gg prime so there is an equality of correlation functions of this form uh, and then you can consider charges so you can have then local operators o with charge so the charge of this will be an element so let me call it q charge q will be an element of the group uh, g hat which is the group of characters of this group g uh, or okay so sorry so that was for abelian group so the charge is going to take be form be some representation in general so this will be a representation r of g And then the general commutativity relation is that if you take this is equal to then you obtain uh, so you evaluate this what was it? Okay. So you go to an operator which is given by G dot O because O is living in a, yeah. So this is the most succinct way of writing it. So you have a collection of operators O which live in a vector space which form the representation R. Uh, and then when you cross it, an operator, a particular operator O in this vector space gets replaced by the, act, uh, the operator obtained by acting G or no? Yes, RG. So this, yes, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And in the previous cases, this representation was a character. So they, that given sign over here. Right. Okay. So now uh, we notice that there is a parameter over here, which is the co dimension. So we are using manifolds of dimension D minus one on which we place these operators. And we can ask whether we can increase the co dimension. So we can ask, we can consider topological operators 
of co-dimension p plus 1. And here p can take various values, it bigger than or equal to 0, and it can go up to dimension 0, up to point like operators. Okay. Yes. So if you have. Right. Yes. So if you have topological operators of co dimension P plus 1, we say that we have a P form symmetry. So this gives rise to a P form symmetry. Can we continuous or discrete? Anything? No. This is, this is a different language. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then in this language, zero form symmetries are the same as ordinary symmetries. Okay. And then these P form symmetries might form a group just like zero form symmetries which is obtained by stacking the operators. So if you have two operators ug on m d minus, let me just write over here. So you just replace this by p minus 1. And then you have an equality of correlation functions like this. But this thing needs to be modified because if you have just a local operator, and a higher co-dimension co uh, topological operator, when you move it past it, you can just move it without actually uh, uh, actually colliding with it. So there won't be an action of this form. So this will remain O for a higher form symmetry. Uh, you're moving this and putting it on top of this operator. So basically, ug times ug prime is ug prime. That's the usual group realization of the I mean, the realization of the group for ordinary It can be projective also, right? Uh, yes, uh, that would be the case of Thuft anomalies. Yeah, but it won't be on this, but on some operators. So this this is just a this is a law of uh, the group, the symmetry that is being realized. But when it acts on operators, it might act projectively. So these R's that were written over here might form a projective representation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So I, that's what I'm coming to. Know. So the charged operators for a p-form symmetry are going to have dimension p, as he pointed out. So you will have some, this is a p-dimensional operator, let me call it a defect of dimension p placed along some uh, manifold of p-dimension. And then you can link it by a co-dimension, by a co-dimension p plus 1 operator u. Uh, and now you can, what you can do is you can just collapse it and make it disappear. And then what happens is that you obtain a correlation function with some phase. So there will be some phase over here. General representation. Yeah, it will be a character now because uh, this group must be abelian. Oh, yeah. Yes, because you can move it past. So zero form symmetries can be non-abelian, but for higher form symmetries, I can always take G and G prime and move it around it, and then it becomes G prime G. Okay. So. Yeah. 
that it cannot act on it yes it, it cannot act so if you have an operator of this form then this linking is trivial because you can move it and then collapse it on the other side then there will be no phase in that situation yes the co dimension p plus 1 or no there there will be like for wilson lines mm -hmm. uh depends on whether it's a gauge invariant operator the local operator is gauge invariant or not yeah Yeah. Yeah. So, so in general, the the e to the i. Theta. So, can you just say a little bit what values? So, theta can take any values, and then there's probably a charge associated to d there also. Yeah. And in general, have a q, e to the uh, i theta q or something. Uh, let me expand on this. So, this theta was not related to u; it was related to d. Let, let me write down the general structure. So, say we are looking at a p-form symmetry group. Uh, and the group is gamma p uh, right so that means we have co dimension p plus 1 operators labeled by elements of gamma p with whose fusion is given by the group multiplication law and the charged operators are uh, the charges of some operator so this d which is of dimension p has a charge which is valued in this is an abelian group so it's valued in the group of characters which i label as the pontryagin dual group uh, right and then uh, when you uh, have you, you wrap it by some operator u with a gamma in this gamma p then this is equal to the same operator dp times q evaluated on gamma uh, which is in u1 so uh, this group is just a group of homomorphisms from gamma p to u1 it's a group of characters Well, well, you can have operators which are charged under it, and then they will show you a phase. So you can have some impurity in the middle, which is charged under. Yeah. Then they not see not not be charged. The two things is a link. Yes. They also are not. Yeah. 
You mean if it's linked with the with the with the, with with the charged the operator? operator. Yeah. That's true. I see. I see. Oh, that's what you mean. Yeah. So you then you need a node or something. You just put the operator in the middle. Yeah. Goes around it. Yes, so when it does not link, that is an identity operator which is charge zero always. Right. So yeah, but then you can ultimately collapse it. Yeah, but yeah. you have a product of e-commerce. Yes. Or, yes. Here, for example, let's say competition here. Take a local operator which I operate with this steering. Collapse it on the operator. Yeah. So then you will not have another U of G on the right hand side. Yeah. You just have U of G is how you go, giving uh, the charge to you. Right. But I'm just asking that. Suppose you just taking more, not one light button, multiple ones. Right. So I should write it as a crossing relation. So uh, this is equal to u gamma. So if I move it past it, and whenever I move it past, I pick a factor of q gamma. That's a more general statement. Yeah. So gamma is labeling what gamma is an element. It's an element in gamma p in the p form symmetry. This is the charge that carry. I know. Dp carries a charge in this in the other group in the Pontryagin tool. Correct. So uh, so gamma is an element of the original group. Yes. Uh, I see. Mm. And so it's Q of gamma. Okay. Yeah. And then you just use this homomorphism given by q and apply it on gamma to obtain this phase upon crossing okay what sets are this event they are the inverse phase of the theorem well they might if you have a non trivial if the Hilbert space is on a co-dimension one manifold, which is, has non-trivial cycles in it. And, and these should wrap the non-trivial uh, non cycles. Yes, they, they will always act on the more higher data, but they can also act on the Hilbert space. Right. Yes. Yes, I'm coming to examples now. So let's look at some examples. And we will consider some uh, the simplest kind of generalized global symmetry. So one form symmetry. I can I can do more. Okay. So let's take a d dimensional u1 gauge theory. So just Maxwell theory in d dimensions without any matter. Uh, then it has field strength f, which is a two form, and star f. So this is a two form, and this is a d minus two form. And the equations of motion say that both of these are closed. So we have df equals to zero and d star f equal to zero. And recall the lesson that we had with the current. Whenever we have a form, closed form, we can integrate it and that becomes a topological operator. So now we here we obtain some operators labeled by theta. Let me call them as magnetic. Uh, and these are defined as exponential of a theta integral f over two manifolds. And then we obtain some electric operators. And so this is what is measuring electric flux. 
this is measuring ma magnetic flux. Uh, and since this is diff this is these are topological operators for any value of theta. Uh, so you have since this is on defined in code dimension two manifolds, you obtain a one form symmetry. And this is defined on code dimension d minus two manifolds. So you obtain d minus three form symmetry. Right. So this this these are examples of higher form symmetries. this question before i mean the operators that you wrote down are, are very simple physically actually they they measure something electric yeah. charge or monopole charge right, right. Uh, where does the symmetry come in actually electric magnetic symmetry are you talking about something like that no or, I, I mean that these operators should be thought of as some u1 symmetries because they are topological and they measure some line operators in your theory they don't measure point operators like usual symmetries they measure the presence of line operators, like in a probe electron or a probe magnetic monopole. Yes, but I think it is what uh, the original, like in the discussion, that you can move these things and you can move these in a correlator and the correlator is unchanged. You can deform that surface and then it is, un it's not a symmetry necessarily of commuting with the Hamiltonian uh, in that sense. It is more, uh, it, it's a, yeah, it's a topological. Uh, it, it commutes with the Hamiltonian actually, because you can move it. commute up. with the Hamiltonian in. Uh, it will right. even commute with the stress tensor. So you can deform the metric that that is corresponds to a topological deformation. If you deform the metric, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it commutes with stress tensor. Any symmetry, any higher form symmetry commutes with stress tensor. Stress tensor. I see. Okay, so then that's the stronger sense in which it is a symmetry. Yeah, because. A charge spirit conserves a charge is particles is, is a one dimensional object. Yeah. That's. Uh, what is that in? Yeah. So for this case, the charged operators are Wilson lines. And for these, these are Thoft lines. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, no, I think your purpose, I, I think your point is correct that uh, what we call as a an electric charge because there is no there is no matter content in this pure gauge theory only Wilson lines carry electric charge yeah yes It's not topological anymore. So if you add matter of charge n, this becomes Z n. This this one form symmetry breaks from U1 to Z. Yes. And there, because it's still a magnetic monopoles and you can measure them. So here what happens is that, so tying into the picture that someone proposed, uh, so what happens if line ends? then you should not have a one form symmetry. So when you have, say you add a matter field phi of charge Q, then you can actually, this is not gauge invariant operator because it has charge Q under U1 gauge group, but you can attach it to a Wilson line 
as we usually do and you get, you get a gauge invariant object. The end of the Wilson line has charge minus Q in a sense. So if you attach it to a Wilson line of charge Q, this operator phi gives you a gauge invariant combination of line and local operators. And so that means that anything which has non-trivial linking with this, an operator u theta, uh, it needs to, only those, of, only those u theta can be topological for which this charge was, for which e to the iq theta is equal to 1. Because you can move it around and contract it over here. So that tells you that theta must be valued in zq. No pulls, right? Yeah, but uh, I, I think you can have these operators even without charge, right? And they carry, and they're non-trivial. Yes. Uh, uh, then you have that's U1. what you would have, uh, I mean, even in the, say, when you're on a torus, that is the, the, the Tuft Zn charges for a SUN theory. And, uh, yeah, I'm doing abelian. I will come to non-abelian case. Uh, uh, okay, so. but even, uh, okay, in an abelian case also, if I have an infinite Wilson line, Yeah. Uh, that's like taking a ma magnetic monopole to infinity. I mean, there's yeah. uh, so so without any charge, charge, I can charge. still have uh, yeah. have non-trivial right. operators. Right. But also non-trivial parts must be that even if we add charge, say of uh, three units, mm -hmm. you can still have a subgroup of this charge. Yes, right? you will yeah. still have a Z three one form symmetry. Yeah. Mm. Even though you don't, you can't write the star as commonly. Even though the, these star is there is a local current, but yeah. you have a... Yeah, but you have d star f is proportional to three times something, right? So yeah. local current has got three, but you still have it in this case. Yes. Sorry, this definition of the... Uh, action of your uh, p form symmetry on an operator mm -hmm. looks very local right so suppose i look at that example just look very closely to the place where uh, u theta manifold and the wq mm -hmm. seem to intersect just like that junction over there yeah. and you take it across i naively should get a charge yeah you get this uh, this face yeah but if it's close there uh, according to your argument you could just pull the you pull it out and then so it should also be equal to one yeah, okay. So that means oh, that, that u theta can be topological only if this condition is satisfied. I see, okay. And so that, that tells you that the one-form symmetry group is actually ZQ so instead of U1. So if I has some like unit charge, for example, it's completely broken. Yeah. There's no symmetry. That yes. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. You can also add magnetic matter if you want, and then you can break this D minus 3 form symmetry in a similar way. Uh, just to again clarify, in an abelian gauge, if I put the U1 gauge theory without matter on T4, mm -hmm. then I will still have non-trivial, these we, operators for any theta, right? Right. Yes. And they will obey some non-trivial algebra uh, with each other? Yeah. Uh, U theta and UE will be... There will the U1 group law. There. So these two commute? These two will commute. Yeah. In the... Uh, yeah. Okay, that's because... Uh, it, uh, sorry, they don't come. There's an anomaly. They don't come. Huh, that, that's yeah, what I thought. Yeah. They shouldn't come. Yes, because, uh, yeah, there is a non-trivial. So, yeah, in the presence of integral f, the equation of motion gets modified. Right. Uh, okay. So... Because they are effectively like linking each other, right? It will be like what you wrote, uh, you with... So yeah. u gamma with u e with u m will, will be some phase will be what something uh, times uh, yes um, something if this has phase theta that has phase phi there will be something e to the i theta times phi or something uh, I think theta theta prime huh? not sure theta theta times theta prime theta e to the i theta, 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 theta prime theta. into the other way round yeah. Uh, U E U M is so they are not linking, right? They intersect. They intersect because two dimension d minus two, so they can intersect at a point. Yeah, they can. But supposing uh, uh, they cannot link. They cannot link in this case. But there is still a, a norm. If you move, do some topological manipulations, 
the video open in some phases but i have not developed the technology to describe that anomaly yet yeah okay uh, so is there a what is the peaking of beam as is as high of symmetry is that that does some uh, line of orders or part of the properties why is the language of high of symmetry it is just giving a name but now once you have given it a name you can identify some similar phenomena and so you can uh, universally study the features as yes, some symmetry features, yeah, features okay. yes yes it's topological it's a topological defect and then you can study properties of topological defects independently of a theory yes yeah. but there are other properties like fusion and uh, what happens when you gauge them etc yes yeah but something like the product of uv with um that that's a that also the anomaly is also preserved yeah that uh, along rg flow Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, right. So let's move on to uh, more complicated examples. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, that would be later in next lectures. If you have non trivial topology in Hilbert space, they can act. If you have non trivial topology in Hilbert space, they can act. Thank you. 
but it's representative of a Hilbert space may not be a very simple. Yeah, it's not a sharp line, it's not a They can across the line. It's a commutation relation, it's basically the same. Have to put things at different times. Well, I think they go across. There is some integral over time in one of them that's supposed not to be There's a finite time for each one of them. So it has to pass through that. So it's just a. I think you worked in the Heisenberg picture. So let's move on to non abelian case. So, you know, uh, so, so in this context, people have been talking about. Yeah, uh, the gauge theory is non abelian. Gauge group is going to be non abelian. Yeah. So, in this context, people talk about center symmetry. And this will turn out to actually be a one form symmetry. So let's take the example of an SU2 gauge theory in any dimension. And say pure SU2 gauge theory without any matter. Now I claim that there is a Z2 one form symmetry in this theory, which comes from the center of this group SU2. So the fact that there is no matter content charge under the center used to be called as a center symmetry, but in this language it should be thought of as a one form symmetry. And why is that the case? 
we can again do this kind of an analysis. So we start with some Wilson lines. So Wilson lines are labeled by representations of SU2. Right. Uh, and now we ask which Wilson lines can actually end in this fashion. So you need some local operator to end these Wilson lines. And one of the operators that is available is, a, is the field strength. So you have the field strength of SU2. It transforms in the adjoint. So this is an adjoint of SU2. It's not gauge invariant. But you can make it gauge invariant if you attach it to an adjoint Wilson line. Right, so you can insert the field strength and it lives at the end of adjoint Wilson line. And you can also take products of this field strength. So when you take products, you start uh, generating, you, when you take tensor product of spin one representation with itself and, use, and using tensor product decomposition, you can generate all spin n where n is an integer representations. So you, you can find that any w with spin n has some f to the some f to the, some power that can end it, some component of this. Okay, but there are some Wilson lines that cannot end. So for example, you can have spin half Wilson line. This does not end. And in fact, any spin half integer Wilson line does not end. So there is, you can define now a topological operator as follows. You define it by its action. Hmm? There's no matter, yes. It's a pure guess theory. Uh, so now you can define a topological operator of co-dimension two by saying that it acts on all of these Wilson lines and it has charge one. So it's a Z2 symmetry. Okay, so you can define a topological operator. You uh, D minus two, uh, which is lives in Z2. And why should it be Z2? Uh, well, again, using uh, some well, using the fact that you can take an OP of these. So if you have two of two of the W halves and you take OP of these lines, you generate integer spins, which can end. So whatever the charge is, it should be a Z2 valued object. So you learn that the set of charges has to be Z2 and then the set of symmetries is Pontryagin dual of that as we discussed earlier. And that's the Pontryagin dual of Z2 is also Z2. So you find that this SU2 gauge theory has a Z2 one form symmetry. Uh, So we are going to take this, uh, this form of computing the one form symmetries in terms of some line of op line operators and their endability properties, whether they can end or not. Whether there is a local operator that can sit at the end of this line. Yes. But the integer ones can end because you can compose, you can get field strength. Right. Uh, right. And then because of the OP of this contains the integer ones, is that if you take twice of this, it must be a Z2 value. Whatever one form symmetry that you define must be Z2 valued. Because these have zero charge, these need to have a zero charge. Uh, because of this topological argument, any topological operator, you can move it around and it just becomes a trivial charge over here. 
So the line itself must have trivial charge. Right. Yes. Uh, because you can take OP of this too. So let's say the charge is Q and the OP has charge 2Q and but 2Q is trivial, needs to be trivial. Right. So it's uh, Q is uh, in Z2. So in this case, you don't have an integral expression for U like the one you had there, is it? You are just defining U. Yeah. But do you have an expression like that? No. You don't have. No. Yeah. That is not, it's not possible to write down something. No. Yeah. Uh, maybe it is, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. This is a Dirac string, it's W half. No, it's a Wilson line. So it's a, it's a probe particle of charge uh, half, of a spin half. Oh, in fundamental representation, yeah. So one plus one is zero. Yes. Yeah. That's Yeah. Well, because uh, star f is not going to be gauge invariant. This is not a gauge invariant operator. Yeah. At least not naively, but maybe in some formulation of the theory, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because uh, when you take so the charge of this is going to be two q, right? And in this OP, you find only integer ones, so the charge needs to be two q needs to be zero. Uh, it's just the representation theory. Yeah, U is like uh, it's a vortex. Uh, so it's, yes, yes. So it, the top line sits at the end of it. Yes. Yes. So indeed, for Yes. Yeah. There, there is a whole. Yeah. Right. This U will be. There are holonomies of gauge fields around it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is not a Thoff loop. So Thoff loop sits at the boundary of this. So it's a Dirac string for that. Yeah. So, yeah. This. Is, so you kind of. This is over a D minus two surface, but then the boundary of that. D boundary of that is Thoff loop. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? It's only one and a half hours. <laughs> 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 so, how much more uh, 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 for what you are planning to do for today? Uh, Just uh, two, two minutes? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, in the in a similar fashion, now you can. Sorry. So, let's contrast it first. If you had instead of SO two an SO three gauge theory, so you choose the gauge group to be SO three. So again, you have a pure SO three, and SO three recall is SO two modded out by the center Z two. Then. The Wilson lines, you don't have these Wilson lines anymore, the half integer ones, because they must form representations of SO3. Right? So you only have the integer spin Wilson lines, but they can all end. So this theory does not have one form symmetry. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then you can. Yes, I quotiented the center, yes. 
Yeah. So, in general, I suppose, I mean, for SUN, the center is a billion, certain, but for SON, the center is. Center is always a billion because it commutes with everything. So, it is ZN times, so yeah, it's ZN times some Z2 work. For SUN, it's ZN. For SON, and then SO2. For SO2 and it, it, it's either Z, okay, so Z2, it's always Z2. It's just Z2. Yeah. No, spin 4 has Z2 times Z2, but SO4 has Z2. Yeah. yeah it does not have electric ones. But yeah. Right. Right. Well, we believe that the will the line defects in the theory, all of them are Wilson lines, right? Oh, and, and Thoft lines. Uh, but the Thoft lines can all end. Uh, not in this. Not in SO three. So as SO. So it's a Thoft first. It, Thoft operators are not lines in general dimension. So in four dimension, they are lines. And in uh, in the case of four dimensional SO3 theory, there is a Z21 form symmetry, but that's magnetic coming from Thoft lines. Yeah. So it interchanges Wilson and Thoft lines. Yeah. So in general, it, it has a Z2 D minus 3 form symmetry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and these two actually are related by gauging, but I don't have time to discuss that. Well, similarly, for the SU2, there's only one Z2, there are no, the, the dual one is not there. Yeah. So uh, either you have Z2 D minus 3 or Z2 1 form, unlike the abelian case where you have both symmetries. Okay, yeah. So in this in this way, you can also do SUN. You will find ZN one form symmetry, and for PSUN, you get ZN D minus three form symmetry. Yeah. Okay. So let me stop here. For yeah. SUN, also I think SUN and SUN mod ZN are electric magnetic. Yeah. So you need to get S in this. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so you'll probably be talking about uh, other. I mean, are there, say, for instance, two form symmetries in general in in this right. theory uh, in a non-abelian gauge right. theory? So you can take two form gauge fields, just like we took one form gauge fields. Okay, you can take not two in the ordinary. Ordinary, ordinary gauge, gauge theory, theory, there's nothing. Well, you can get this type. That the D minus three type. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Then I don't know what electric means. So yeah. So yeah, not with uh, you're saying not with one yeah. form. Electric is always one form. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly. Surface defect or something which is. There are some exotic theories that you can do, but I don't understand them fully. You can take SU2 theory, but instead of, uh, so here you are gauging Z2 one form symmetry sort of to go to SO3 theory, but you can try to gauge a Z4, which is, you don't have that much, but you try to over gauge and that would give a Z2 two form symmetry. But I suspect that that theory might just be an SO3 theory coupled to a TQFT and that the two form symmetry is coming from the TQFT part. Just the pure gauge theory is again. Yeah. Uh, there is a 4D TQFT. If you take Z2 gauge theory in four dimensions, so you have 4D Z2 gauge theory. This has a Z2 one form and a two form symmetry. In three dimensions? Yeah. Yeah, if you have Chan Simon's level that makes that breaks uh, one form symmetry more. 
So for an abelian, if you have a U1 gauge theory with Chern Simons level k, you have a ZK one form symmetry only. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, essentially because k a wedge f term in the Lagrangian implies that you can uh, you can put the the field strength is not is going to be placed at the end of Wilson line of charge k. So it gives us that k. Uh, it, it, the center of uh, SU2 also acts on half integer representations with charge 1 and does not act on integer ones. So it has the same action. It has the same action, but yeah, that would be a coincidence. Is there a derivation that this is something else? But if it has the same action, it means that uh, I don't know how to distinguish them without any other information. Yeah. Uh, do a gauge transformation which is not linear. It's periodic up to the center. So that's the action of Z2 on the center. So that way we know that uh, yeah. center actually appears in that action. Okay. That's what distinguishes the prison loop of half-entity spectrum. Mm -hmm. That kind of uh, manifest derivation doesn't seem to appear there. It should be some more indirect thing that, for example, uh, center symmetry distinguishes uh, certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Formed out of right joints, because it's formed out of right joint. Yeah. So it's a more indirect way of seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. All you want to know is that for general group G, it's always the center of the chart. That's the derivation of the chart. And that derivation, of course, is constructing the very same manner of path of the things. That always shows that that is yeah. should be a center. But presumably, here also, that's true. Uh, you will start with general G. Uh -huh. and, and you do this analysis again by taking field strength and taking adjoint decompositions. You always find the center of G. Yeah. So, what about D6? D6, so it's a. Yeah. I think this is doing weight lattice modular root lattice. So the the adjoint removes the root lattice representations. Yeah. It's a weight lattice. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, it's the so, for discrete case groups, you said something else. This is a Z2. Right. It has a two form symmetry as well. Yes. So, there you are not constructing it by some person. No, you, you, you are, but now the gauge fields that you have are discrete. So, you need to use co chains. So, you, the action for the Z2 gauge theory is. It, it has two uh, a1 delta b2 so here the, you have two gauge fields uh, this is this is a this is just a differential at the cochain level so it's like a d uh, and this these these are uh, two gauge fields one is a one form gauge field another is a two form gauge field and this is now four cochain this is the action for this uh, theory the lagrangian yeah, even delta b2. Yeah. So one, one of them does not have a d on it. And now you can construct operators which are e to the i integral a1 and e to the i integral b2. These are on these are on m2. This is on m1. So these are co-dimension two in four dimension. This is one form symmetry. This is two form symmetry. And this gauge theory actually arises when you have a non-confining phase. 
So for example, in SO3 and it goes to one super young mills, there is a vacuum which does not confine. And in that vacuum, the low energy theory is the Z2 gauge theory. Uh, so one form symmetry is this magnetic one, but the two form symmetry comes from the fact that you have a, you have a Thoft line which shows perimeter law. So the Thoft line becomes topological operator, a non-zero topological operator in the infrared, which is this M1 operator. Uh, well, yeah, hmm. well, for SU2 gauge theory, which has an electric one form symmetry, both back are confining. Yeah, uh, yeah, because the UV only had magnetic. So uh, if you can just give an example where the, to illustrate the power of this for saying something which is, uh, uh, which would not be obvious mm -hmm. without this language. Right. So for example, that a non-confining vacuum will have Z2 gauge theory in the infrared. Hmm. This won't be obvious. Uh, or even what happens in a confining or an oblique confining vacuum. So. Uh, So you can classify confining versus non-confining phases. So confinement means that you are going to have area law for all the line operators. So what this means is that if you go pull your line operator, you compute their web at infinite loops, they have to go to zero. There is no local counter term which can make it non-zero. So this web is zero in the far infrared and all these line operators disappear. So you know that the theory that you obtain, so suppose you knew that you had a gap vacuum and now you're considering whether if it's confining, what, what will happen? What's the low energy theory? So you know that now you are going to have, let's do the Z21 form symmetry case. You're going to have the Z21 form symmetry, which was from the ultraviolet. So you still have that. But that's it, there is no other symmetries. So you need to look for 4 DTQFTs which only have a Z21 form symmetry. Uh, so for example, they can be SPT phases for this Z21 form symmetry. Uh, and there are two of these. So there are two of these uh, theories. And both of them arise in the two vacua of the, of the SU2 and equals to one super young mills. The non-trivial SPT is called the oblique confining, confinement uh, and the trivial SPT is the non-oblique one. For the non-confining case, uh, you have a line which shows perimeter law. So you have a, you have again web which after adding a counter term can be made non-zero. And so that means that you should have an an operator at low energies, which is a line operator, which and which is Z2. So you obtain, you, your theory must be, have a single vacuum and it should have a one form and a two form symmetry, Z2 two form symmetry. And then this only candidate is that Z2 gauge theory. Right. So if you want to Yes. Or get, get more information like what will be the partition function of the low energy theory on any arbitrary manifold. If you know it's a Z2 gauge theory, now you can compute it. Yeah. So that would be one application. Can you classify all the topological theories which have a fixed number of one form, two form, so on, symmetries. If I tell you that the low energy theory has some Z, Z2, one form, Z2, two form, maybe yeah. some 
no three form etc mm-hmm. can i classify all the yeah you can attempt to classify i don't know if it has been classified but uh, you can certainly attempt to classify it yeah so you need to also know whether they have an anomaly in between them or not so here i use the fact that these two there is a mixed anomaly between these two symmetries oh, i see which was the fact that this was charged under the one form symmetry so the operators do not commute with each other the topological operators yeah all this was uh discovered in the age yes yes mm-hmm. right yeah mm-hmm. yeah so you can phrase those theories as a sample and principle that at low energies you seem like you have some higher form symmetries but they cannot be there so they should be gauged and then you see discrete gauge fields so let's uh, thank lakshya again and uh, we meet again tomorrow at uh, 2:30 yeah each day the timing is different so uh,